Today, an opera of Canaries, a market update for the 4th of June 2022. Hi again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, one that is post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. And yes, folks, the collective noun for a group of canaries is an opera. And it seems fitting given recent discombobulated events and data. The birds are getting well flighty. As always in this week's market review, I'm going to start with the US. Now, I'm often asked why I focus here. And it's simply this. It's because as the US dollar is so dominant and the US markets are so big, our markets follow like a playful puppy. We hardly think for ourselves, but ape what the US did. And we will also cover Europe and Asia, where, by the way, several markets were closed on Friday before then coming back to talk about Australia. And in passing, we'll touch on gold, commodities and crypto as we go through. Now, US stocks resumed their trend of weekly losses after strong hiring data cleared the way for the Federal Reserve to remain aggressive in its fight against inflation. Treasuries fell and the dollar strengthened against peers. The Dow Jones Industrial Average slipped 1.05% to 32,898. The Nasdaq fell 2.47% to 12,012. And the S&P 500 fell 1.63% to 4,108. And the financials index, by the way, was up 1.41% to 586.81, while the VIX rose 0.28% to 2479, a little down on recent highs, suggesting perhaps a little less fear in the markets for now, but still elevated. Stocks turned sharply lower on Friday after the May hiring data topped expectations, suggesting the labour market remains robust enough for the Fed to raise rates quickly as it battles runaway price gains. The US central banks expected to raise rates by 50 basis points at its next two meetings. Market derived odds for a third hike of that magnitude in September has now held steady at 85% after the jobs report. Non-farm payrolls increased 390,000 last month after a revised 436,000 gain in April, according to the Labor Department report. The unemployment rate held at 3.6% and the labor force participation rate crept higher. The result was actually stronger than economists expected. Job growth in May was led by steady hiring in leisure and hospitality, business services and education and healthcare. Retail trade, however, suffered a 60,700 decrease in payrolls in a relatively broad decline across various categories. Even with the drop, retail employment remains above pre-pandemic levels. Leisure and hospitality added 84,000 jobs in May, most of which were in accommodation and food services, and employment in business and professional services rose 75,000, and payrolls increased by 74,000 in education and healthcare. Construction employment registered a 36,000 gain, the most in three months. But payrolls in the industry are at a risk of cooling eventually against a backdrop of higher mortgage rates that have been slowing demand for housing. The labour force participation rate, that's the share of the population that is working or looking for work, rose to 62.3%, and the rate for workers aged 25 to 54 climbed to a pandemic high of 82.6%. Overall participation has been slow to recover to pre-pandemic levels after many Americans left their workforce for good during the pandemic, in part due to childcare challenges and early retirement. So the report suggests that employers have had success filling open positions in the month and it also potentially provides more broader reassurance that the economy can achieve a soft landing as wage gains moderate from their more rapid pace through most of 2021. But average hourly earnings rose less than forecast, 0.3% from April, the same as the previous month. They were up 5.2% from a year earlier. That's a slowdown from 5.5% in April. The jobs report will provide mixed feelings for the Fed, which will welcome the steadier jobless rate, firmer participation rate, and possible softening in wages while worrying that the economy is still running too hot to convincingly drive inflation back to the target, Sal Guattari, senior economist at BMO Capital Markets, said. 
In fact, the gain in employment in May was the weakest since April 2021, and there is probably going to be a further downshift in the months ahead. Yet, despite talk of hiring freezes, there are still nearly two job openings for every unemployed person, which means outright job losses are unlikely near term. Overall job growth is expected to slow in the coming months, though, as the labour market reaches pre-pandemic employment levels and the unemployment rate remains historically low. That means monthly payroll gains of half a million or more, as experienced over the last two years, are likely for the US. Now, the figures may provide some comfort to President Joe Biden and Democrats as they face a difficult challenge defending their thin congressional majorities in the November midterm elections. Even so, rapid price gains have far outweighed plentiful jobs in polls of Americans that have shown unhappiness with the economy and disapproval of Biden's performance. In fact, later Biden touted the state of the US economy following a better than expected jobs report, even as he acknowledged it's likely to be overshadowed by record high inflation that's causing pain for Americans. I know that even with today's good news, a lot of Americans remain anxious and I understand the feeling, Biden said on Friday. He added, there's no denying that high prices, particularly around gasoline and food, are a real problem for people. But there's every reason for the American people to feel confident that we'll meet these challenges. I understand that families who are struggling probably don't care why the prices go up. They just want them to go down. And the president, again, sought to shift responsibility to Republicans who, along with Democratic Senator Joe Manchin of West Virginia, have stalled his economic agenda in Congress. I'm doing everything I can on my own to help working families during this stretch of higher prices, he said. I'm going to continue to do that, but Congress needs to act as well. So the S&P 500 slumped 1.6% in the afternoon, tipping the benchmark index into negative territory for the eighth week in the past nine weeks. And Tesla also dragged tech shares lower on Friday after reports that the company plans to reduce its salaried workforce. Shares in Tesla tumbled 9.2% to $703.55 in New York. It shed 38% of its market value from early April. Chief Executive Officer Elon Musk said the electric car maker needs to cut staff by around 10%, according to an internal mail titled Pause All Hiring Worldwide. Though actually it relates to white collar ranks, which were bloated, he said, and he would keep hiring workers to make cars and batteries, so the real number could be closer to 5%. But he has a, quote, super bad feeling, unquote, about the economy. And this could be the auto industry's canary in the coal mine moment, signalling a recession for an industry whose bosses have shown no signs of concern up till now. US new car sales in May finished at a weak analysed rate of 12.69 million, according to Ward's intelligence. That's a far cry from the glory days of 17 million a year pre-COVID. Must warning is the first loud and public dissent in a united stance by the auto industry that underlying demand for cars and trucks remains strong despite two years of a global pandemic. One executive this week called demand sky high. Tesla's not your average canary in the coal mine. It's more like a whale in the lithium mine, Morgan Stanley analyst Adam Jonas said in a research note, referring, of course, to the metals used in EV batteries. And Josh Sandbilt, the chief investment officer at Greenhaven Associates, that's a money management firm that is a large investor in General Motors, has been in New York City saying financial CNOs there have been far more gloomy in their outlook than other business leaders. And while Musk's email sounds far more pessimistic than other manufacturing leaders, Sam Book says he has learned not to dismiss the Tesla CEO because he has zagged when others have zigging. And he's been proven right. We're in a period of discombobulation and frankly, the financial world and the business leadership world don't agree, he said. At some point, we'll get the answer as to who's correct. Musk's gloomy outlook on the economy comes just days after J.P. Morgan Chief Executive Jamie Dimon said the bank was bracing for an economic hurricane. Not good for canaries. 
The second half of 2022 is going to be a roller coaster ride for investors unless the Fed is able to bring inflation under control without a hard landing, said Peter Essel, head of portfolio management at Commonwealth Financial Network. Most investors seem to be wagering on a crash and burn scenario at this point as recessionary fears abound and equity markets fail to develop any sort of positive momentum. Apple, Microsoft, Alphabet, Meta Platforms and Amazon were all in the red on Friday. And chip stocks also piled the pressure on following a slump in Micron after Piper Sandler downgraded the company to underweight from neutral, citing pricing pressures and softer demand. Coinbase also flagged worries about the macroeconomic backdrop after the cryptocurrency exchange extended a hiring pause and said it would rescind some accepted job offers it closed at 66.69. And CrowdStrike fell more than 7% even as it raised full-year guidance and reported first quarter results that beat on both the top and bottom lines. And airlines, which have racked up gains recently on bets of a summer boon for travel demand, were also in the firing line after American Airlines Group forecast capacity toward the lower end of guidance, citing a lack of staff. Delta Airlines and United Airlines were down about 3%. Investors remain beholden to economic data and how it will impact the pace of US monetary tightening as worries mount that a restrictive Fed could throw the world's largest economy into a recession. The strong jobs report quelled some concern that growth was slowing too sharply, while at the same time clearly the path for the Fed is to stay aggressive. People were hoping for a number that would be able to dissuade the Fed from their stated plan of continual 50 basis point hikes and quantitative tightening. And they didn't get it today, Steve Sosnick, Chief Strategist at Interactive Brokers, said. What this number tells the Fed is, go ahead and keep hiking rates like crazy because you're not creating unemployment. You can put pain into risk markets to hopefully cool demand. And that's not what we want to see. And I think it's been reflected in the stock market today, said Jim Bianco, founder of Bianco Research. The Fed decision is a done deal at this point. So this report is more about what it tells us about underlying demand and the economy's ability to handle everything. It's a good report that shows the general population is coming back into the labour force, said Sean Cruz, head trading strategist at TD Ameritrade. Meanwhile, energy shares advanced as crude reached a $120 a barrel in New York, securing its sixth straight week of gains. With the summer driving season underway, soaring gasoline prices remained a potential liability for Biden, who has endeavoured to boost energy supplies to replace Russian output following Putin's invasion of Ukraine. U.S. gasoline futures settled at a fresh record of $4.19 a gallon on Thursday, as pump prices also hit a new high. Brent crude rose 1.8% to 121.32 a barrel, and U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude advanced 2.9% to 120.86. The Saudi-led OPEC Plus cartel agreed on Thursday to a modest oil production increase in July and August, a gesture that was welcomed by the Biden administration. Asked about OPEC Plus on Friday, Biden called it a positive development, but said he didn't know if the increase in output would be enough. And now markets are expecting rising demand as China eases COVID-19 pandemic-related restrictions, at least for now. Gold prices, however, fell nearly 1% after bullion's appeal was dented by the rise in the US dollar and Treasury yields following the strong jobs data. Gold closed at 1,854. Ten-year Treasury yields edged back towards 3%. The benchmark 10-year notes, they were up at 2.941%, while the rate-sensitive two-year note gained and was up to 2.6565. The US dollar edged higher against a basket of currencies after that employment report. The dollar index rose 0.383% to 102.14, and the euro was down 0.25% to 1.0719. But Bitcoin fell below $30,000 again and was last down 2.4% to 29747 so it's still in the doldrums with little direction. European indices opened higher in trading on Friday morning, picking up where the US indices left off on Thursday, but they fell away later. 
At the close in Frankfurt, the DAX declined to 0.17% to 14,460, while the CAC 40 was down 0.23% to 6,485. And the FTSE 100 was closed for trading due to the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. The Pan-European Stock 600 Index fell 0.26% with volumes expected to be subdued due to those holidays in Britain and also in China and ended the week down 0.9% at 440.08. The rate sensitive information technology sector led losses on the stock 600, while the auto sector declined 1.6% as Francis Forica slid 6.8% to 23.78. Investors ramped up their bets on ECB interest rates rising this year and priced in a bigger 50 basis point hike at one of the bank's policy meetings by October, following data this week showing record high inflation in the Eurozone at 8.1%. The big economic news was German export numbers, which came in ahead of expectations at 4.4%, as did the trade surplus, coming in at 3.5 billion euros, against an expectation of 1.6 billion euros. This came with the backdrop of fears that the Russian-Ukraine war and related sanctions would could potentially have slowed the European economy down. Eurozone manufacturing output growth stalled last month, though, as factories struggled to source raw materials, while demand took a knock from steep price pressures and fears about the economic outlook, according to a survey. Russia's invasion of Ukraine, coupled with renewed COVID-19-related lockdowns in China, have exacerbated supply chain bottlenecks and left factories struggling, and forward-looking indicators in the survey did not point to an imminent turnaround. The seasonally adjusted S&P Global Eurozone PMI Composite Output Index fell to a four-month low of 54.8 in May. That's down from 55.8 in April. And while the headline measure was still indicative of economic growth across the euro area, it also highlighted a loss in momentum. This slowdown was exclusively a result of a softer service sector expansion amid signs that the post-lockdown rebound was losing some strength. Nevertheless, services activity continued to rise at a robust pace and masked clear weaknesses within the goods producing sector. Although manufacturing output growth edged slightly higher from April 2022's month low, it was subdued and below its long run average. And there was evidence of sustained capacity constraints across the Eurozone private sector in May as backlogs of work rose for a 15th month in a row. Staffing issues, material shortages and rising new order intakes each contributed to a buildup of outstanding business. To help work through backlogs and accommodate for anticipated demand, private sector employment across the year has only increased during May. And in fact, the rate of job creation accelerated to a 10-month high. But business confidence eased slightly and was among the weakest seen since mid-2020. The war in Ukraine, rising prices, supply frictions and a general slowdown in the economy were all cited as concerns by surveyed companies. And on the price front, latest survey data continued to highlight severe inflationary pressures across the euro area. Although the increase in input costs was the slowest for three months, it was faster than anything seen prior to this. And rising wage and energy bills were accompanied by higher raw materials and fuel costs, according to the report. To protect margins, prices charged were raised during May. And overall, the rate of output price inflation was the second steepest on record and surpassed only that seen in April. In other words, more inflation ahead. In Asia, markets were also twitchy, though stock markets in both China and Hong Kong were closed for a public holiday on Friday. China continues to reopen partially after the COVID lockdown and continues to stimulate the economy. For example, the central government ordered state-owned banking heavyweights to set up an 800 billion yuan or $120 billion line of credit for infrastructure projects. The Japanese Nikkei was up 1.27% to 27,761 and the South Korean Cosby was up 0.44% to 2,670. Down here in Australia, Australian shares rallied on Friday as strong gains in materials and tech stocks pulled the benchmark higher for the third week in a row. The S&P ASX 200 rose 0.9% to 7,238, taking its weekly gain to just 0.8%. Materials advanced the most, boosted by demand for iron ore. Champion Iron was the biggest index outperformer, up 8.1% to $7.84. 
BHP Group jumped 2.5% to 46.76, and Rio Tinto rallied 2.7% to 116.03. Fortescue Metals rose 4.1% to 21.46. Lithium stocks extended their rebound from Wednesday's sell-off led by Pilbara Minerals up 7.5% to $2.45, closely followed by Liontown Resources 6.7% higher at $1.27. The local technology sector nudged up 2.3%, tracing a strong advance by the Nasdaq overnight Thursday. Live360 rose 4.3% to 3.38, and Afterpay's parent block leapt 4.5% to 11976. The major banks' results were mixed with CBay and NAB slightly lower, while ANZ and Westpac edged up between 0.2 and 0.3%. Pathology and day hospital player Helios was the biggest laggard, down 8.6% at $3.80 after flagging a difficult second half of its financial year, and the consumer discretionary sector was the only index category to post a loss, albeit a small one. Shares in Incant's healthcare leapt 8% to 40.5 cents after positive results from clinical trials to treat sleep apnea. The Australian dollar was at 72.08 cents in the session, putting on track for a third straight weekly gain, bolstering the local currency or expectations of higher interest rates and the reasonable GDP result that came out this week. The Reserve Bank of Australia holds its policy meeting on Tuesday and is considered certain to raise its 0.35% cash rate for the second month in a row. Interbank futures are fully pricing in a quarter point lift and gives an 82% chance of a larger 40 basis point increase. Westpac Chief Economist Bill Evans argues the best decision would be to move by 40 basis points. That would eliminate the emergency stimulus from 2020 and send a clear signal that the board recognises its formidable task to move inflation back within the target band by 2024 and is prepared to act decisively, he said. And about a third of economists polled by Reuters expect a 0.4 percentage point lift. So I'm afraid those canaries are getting pretty antsy what with higher interest rates, higher inflation, slowing economies and weakening stock markets. Nothing here other than to suggest that uncertainty is going to continue and indeed market performance will be weaker, I think, in the months ahead. The fact of the matter is those interest rate rises are going to come through and it's going to hit everybody and everything. And I still am not convinced personally that the market has fully taken in and taken on board the implications of that. Not least, of course, in Australia, with the very high leverage that households have to their mortgages, and of course the fact that we are very reliant on what happens internationally. And if demand from China relating to, for example, iron ore tails away because they have issues, well, that could be negative for us too. Therefore, watch the canaries, but unfortunately they do seem to be making something of a racket just now. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.